ever find yourself like glued to the couch, endlessly scrolling, even though you swore you'd hit the gym? Oh, tell me about it. It's like our motivation just takes a sudden vacation. We've all been there. Right. Well, get ready to decode those moments because this deep dive is all about those fascinating forces behind what makes us tick. We're taking a deep dive into chapter 16 of Cooper's Applied Behavior Analysis. Ah, yes. Motivating operations. Exactly. We're going to unpack this whole concept of motivating operations or MOs. And trust me, you'll start seeing them everywhere. It's true. They're kind of like these, these hidden puppet masters. Yeah. You know, influencing our desires and our aversions in ways we rarely, like, stop to consider. Okay, so no more dangling carrots and waving sticks. That's kind of our usual go-to for understanding motivation. Right. And it's tempting to think it is that simple. Yeah. But, but Cooper argues that our our desires and aversions, are, they're way more intricate than that. It's not just about whether a reward is, you know, enticing or a punishment is scary. It's about how much we value those things at any given moment. And that can change like that. So it's not the carrot. It's how much we want the carrot right now. Yes. That makes sense. Like, I'm craving Mexican food like crazy, even though I literally just ate a giant lunch. Just the the mere thought of tacos, it's like, it's doing something to me. Exactly. <laughs> and that, my friend, is a motivating operation, or MO, at work. They don't just make us move or not move. They actually change how much we value things, you know, in real time. It's yeah. like, like they're messing with our wants and not wants on the fly. Wait, hold up. So are you saying my my sudden taco craving, even on a full stomach, is because of this this MO thing? It very well could be. And, and that's just one example. Cooper breaks down how these MOs have two main effects on us, and they're happening like at the same time. Okay, let's unpack this. Hit me with effect number one. All right, so the first effect is what we call value altering. Basically, how much do we care about a reward, or how much are we dreading a punishment? at this very moment. Mm -hmm. That craving you mentioned, that's your brain deciding those tacos are suddenly super valuable, even if logically, you know you're not actually hungry. Okay, so the value of the reward or the fear factor of the punishment can can change based on what exactly? A whole bunch of things, as you'll see. But the key takeaway here is that our motivation isn't just about the reward or punishment itself. It's about how much we care about it in that particular moment. And that's where MOs come in. They're the things shifting those value levels behind the scenes. Okay, so MOs are like messing with how much we care about the carrot or the stick at any given moment. That's effect number one, right? What about that second effect these MOs have on us? Right. So alongside that, that value altering effect, there's the... Um, behavior altering effect. Okay. Basically, how likely are we to actually do something to get that reward or avoid the punishment? So effect one is making the tacos more appealing. And effect two is making me more likely to actually like order them, even if it means battling rush hour traffic to hit that drive through. Precisely. It's like this, you're sudden craving for Mexican food. That's increasing the value of those tacos in that moment, right? Yeah. Cooper would call that an establishing operation or EO. It's making that reward more appealing. Okay. Got it. EOs increase the value. So does that mean there's something that decreases it too? You bet. Remember that that giant lunch you mentioned? Yeah. That feeling of fullness. That's working in the opposite direction, you know, making those tacos less tempting. That's an abolishing operation or AO in action, decreasing the value of the reward. This is blowing my mind. It's like learning a whole new language for something we experience every single day, you know. But back to effect number two, how likely we are to act. If an EO is making me crave tacos... What's like pushing me towards that drive through? That would be the, the evocative effect of the MO. Yeah. The EO increases the value of the tacos, and that evocative effect makes you more likely to actually go after them. The evocative, yeah. evoking action. Okay, makes sense. So if I'm like stuffed after that giant lunch that's an AO decreasing how much I want tacos, is there an opposite effect for like not taking action? Exactly. That would be the abative effect. The AO is making the tacos less appealing. And the dative effect means you're less likely to hop in the car and brave that traffic. Okay, I think I'm getting this. MOs are like these invisible forces always at work, changing how much we care about things that's value altering and how likely we are to actually take action, the behavior altering effect. But how do we even know what triggers these MOs in the first place? That's where things get even more interesting. Yeah. Some MOs are unlearned, like like being hungry or thirsty. Right. We're hardwired to respond to those. Right. You know, no one taught you to, to want food when you're hungry. Right. Those are called unconditioned MOs or UMOs. They're, they're universal. They, they affect everyone. Okay. Those UMOs make sense. It's like survival instincts almost. But what about those those learned motivators? Like my best friend, she practically starts drooling when she sees like 
those neon signs for that that fancy coffee place even if she just had a coffee it's like definitely not a survival thing you're onto something that's a perfect example of a conditioned mo or cmo yeah okay. they're learned through through our experiences and they can be just as powerful as those those hardwired umos yeah your friend probably has like a positive association with that that specific coffee place maybe it reminds her of you know, cozy mornings or catching up with friends. So it's not just the coffee itself. It's the whole experience she's learned to associate with it. It's fascinating. It's like our brains are constantly making these connections and they're they're mm -hmm. influencing our desires without us even like realizing it. Right. But, but CMOs, those sound complicated. Are there like different types of learned motivators? Okay, so CMOs are those learned motivators and they come in different like flavors, right? Like my friend's coffee craving. What kind of CMO is that? Huh? Her coffee craving. Oh, that's a good one triggered by that specific coffee shop. Mm. That's likely what Cooper calls a surrogate CMO or... Um, CMOS. CMOS. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's all about those learned associations. The The coffee shop itself mm -hmm. has become, you know, linked to that feeling of enjoyment. So even just the sight of it can, like, trigger the craving. CMOS. So it's like how I get that urge to, like, check my phone the second I hear that notification sound, even if I know it's probably just spam. It's the sound that's become the CMOS, not the the actual message. Right? Spot on. And think about those times you're you're driving and you suddenly feel the urge to use the restroom just because you saw a restroom sign. Oh, yeah. That's another classic example of a CMOS at work. The sign itself triggers the urge, even if you didn't you know, feel it before. It's like our brains are playing these these sneaky tricks on us, making us want things we didn't even know we wanted a minute ago. <laughs> okay, so what about those other types of CMOs? What are they up to? Well, imagine you've got a deadline looming at work. Oh, boy. As it gets closer and closer, the pressure builds, right? Oh, yeah. That that sense of urgency. There's a reflexive CMO or CMOR kicking in. CMOR. It's like a warning signal in my brain, that feeling of, if I don't finish this project, bad things will happen and and suddenly I'm I'm motivated to get to work even if it means, you know, canceling all my evening plans. Exactly. It's like the CMOR, it establishes its own like offset as a mm -hmm. reinforcer. We're not just motivated by the the positive outcome of finishing the task, but we're also driven to, you know, escape that unpleasant feeling of of the warning signal itself. So CMOSs are triggered by like associations and CMORs are those internal alarm bells. What's left? Tell me there's a CMO that's a little less um, anxiety inducing. Don't worry, not all CMOs are about about cravings or warnings. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're you're a builder working on a project. Okay. And and you need a a specific type of screwdriver. Right. You inherently desire that screwdriver. Right. But it becomes incredibly valuable because you need it to finish the job. That's a yeah. that's a transitive CMO or CMOT at play. Okay, so the screwdriver itself isn't the goal, but it's it's essential for like reaching the goal. Exactly. So it's it's like when I'm trying to to build a new habit, like going for a run every morning. I don't necessarily love laying out my workout clothes the night before, but but it makes that morning run so much easier. Yeah. Laying out those clothes, that's my CMOT. It it makes the actual goal more achievable. Precisely, the CMOT laying out your clothes makes that desired behavior going for a run more likely to happen. Mm. It's a subtle but powerful way that our motivations can be like influenced. This is all so fascinating, but is there like actual proof that MOs hold this much sway over us? Or are we just talking like theories and anecdotes here? Oh, the proof is out there. Yeah. The book mentions this study where researchers looked at how much access kids had to treats before a um, preference test. Okay. And the kids who'd been deprived of treats they were way more excited about them during the test compared to the kids who, you know, hadn't been deprived. They were like practically begging for those treats. So even something as simple as like choosing a snack can be influenced by these MOs. It makes you wonder how much of our behavior is driven by these these forces we're often not even aware of. Exactly. MOs are everywhere. They're influencing how we respond to instructions, how susceptible we are to like peer pressure, even how persuasive we find certain arguments. They're like these these hidden currents shaping our decisions and behaviors like all the time. Knowing about MOs, it, it feels like I've unlocked some some secret code to to understanding human behavior. It's like that aha moment when you when you realize why you do the things you do or why other people act the way they do. And the best part is it's not just about understanding, it's about empowerment, right? Right. Imagine you're a therapist and you have a client who's struggling with with motivation issues. Knowing about MOs can help you understand the root cause of those struggles and develop much more like effective treatment plans. 
it's like having a whole new toolkit for like approaching challenges and and achieving goals right instead right. of just thinking i need to be more motivated we can ask ourselves what what mo's are at play here how can i like shift those to work in my favor exactly it's a whole new way of thinking about motivation mm -hmm. on that note we've reached the end of our deep dive into motivating operations so there you have it hopefully you're leaving this deep dive with a whole new understanding of what makes us tick remember next time you find yourself inexplicably drawn to like a plate of tacos or suddenly hit with the urge to like clean your entire house yes take a moment to consider what's the mo at play here what is the mo We'll catch you next time for another deep dive into a topic that will leave you feeling informed and inspired.